Everybody ready? Ready? Yeah. All right. Listen. It's your weekend show. Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. With Bob Bierman. It's great. Welcome to your weekend show. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. As we do this broadcast on the Memorial Day holiday weekend here in the United States. Just a few words about Memorial Day, if you don't mind. Memorial Day, originally called Decoration Day, is a day of remembrance for those who have died in the service of the United States. Now, I know in this day and age, sometimes it's more of just a three-day holiday weekend, and many people have lost sight of what Memorial Day is all about. Over two dozen cities and towns claim to be the birthplace of Memorial Day. Waterloo, New York was officially declared the birthplace of Memorial Day by President Lyndon Johnson back in 1966, but but it's difficult to prove the actual origins of the day. Now, regardless of the exact day or location, one thing is clear. Memorial Day was born out of the Civil War in a desire to honor our dead. It was officially proclaimed on the 5th of May back in 1868 by General John Logan, the national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. In fact, U.S. Highway 6 is named after the Grand Army of the Republic. It's called the Grand Army of the Republic Highway. And it's a highway that runs from Massachusetts through Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and finally terminates in California, a highway that's just shy of 3,200 miles. Now, General John Logan, in his General Order Number 11, stated the 30th of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet and churchyard across the entire land. He proclaimed the date of Declaration Day, as he called it, was chosen because it wasn't the anniversary of any particular battle. On the first Declaration Day, General James Garfield made a speech at the Arlington National Cemetery, and 5,000 participants decorated the graves of the 20,000 Union and Confederate soldiers that were buried there. Now, the first state to officially recognize the holiday was New York in 1873, and by 1890, it was recognized by all the northern states. The southern states refused to acknowledge the day, honoring their dead on separate days until after World War I, when the holiday changed from just honoring those who died during the Civil War to honoring Americans who died fighting in any war. It is now observed in virtually every state on the last Monday in May, with the Congressional Passage of the National Holiday Act of 1971. Now, this helped ensure a three-day weekend for federal holidays, though several southern states have an additional separate day still for honoring the Confederate dead. Uh, January 19th in Texas, April 26th in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and Mississippi, May 10th in South Carolina, and June 3rd, which is Jefferson Davis's birthday in Louisiana and Tennessee. Now, today... Memorial Day is considered the unofficial start of summer, though this year several states in the north and northeast, including parts of Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Maine may see frost or freeze, which makes you wonder just a little bit about global warming, but back to the topic at hand. Memorial Day is the day we remember that those that serve this nation in times of war, and they pay the ultimate price. From the beginning of this nation, during the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, through the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, the two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, and more recently, the Middle East Gulf region. Throughout our history, there have been countless examples in all these wars of individuals that, that did heroic things in wartime to save the lives of others. I can think of stories that of those that jumped on a hand grenade or or put their lives in peril and lost their lives in an effort to save other people. This week, I was listening to a local radio station here in my my hometown of Vero Beach. 
And I called a radio show where they were discussing an incident of self-sacrifice that occurred back during the Second World War. Now, this show is hosted by an individual by the name of Ralph Oko, who happens to be an avid collector with years of experience in memorabilia and collectible items. Now, Ralph was born in Israel in 1945, immigrated to the United States in 1956, and became a naturalized citizen at the age of 17 in 1962. Ralph has lived in Chicago. He lived there until 1965. He attended Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. He has a degree in business administration with a minor in mathematics and economy and U.S. history. In 1981, he moved to southeast Florida, eventually settling in Vero Beach in 2010. And here in Vero Beach, Ralph has involved himself with things like the Harvest Food and Outreach Center, Plus, he hosts a a weekly radio show. Now, his guest for the show that I heard was Larry Wapnick. Now, Larry is the uh, commander and past commander of the Jewish War Veterans Post 506 in Indian River County, Florida, and also a chaplain. He's also on the chapel of the Four Chaplains Legion Honor Medal recipient, member of the board of directors of the chapel of the four chaplains in philadelphia pennsylvania and and numerous i mean too many to name civic and religious organizations larry lived for a long time in woodbridge connecticut and new haven connecticut for many years and he was the advertising director for american express publishing he also owned camera works in new haven and ended up in florida in 1998 full-time he served in the united states army during the vietnam conflict with an honorable discharge in 1965. Now, on the program that I heard, they shared the true story of sacrifice given by four chaplains in the United States Army. One of the chaplains was Roman Catholic. Two of them were Protestant, um, actually one in the Reformed Church and one the Presbyterian Church, and the other one Jewish. Now, with uh, their permission, I would like to share a small part of the radio broadcast that I heard, and I want to I sincerely thank Larry for making this possible for me to air. In John chapter 15, we find these words. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, here's Ralph Oko. Okay, so now... February 3rd, 1943. Now we are already in World War II officially as of December 8th. We're deeply involved. Here we are. We're in a convoy that is in the North Atlantic Ocean. The weather is horrendous. The uh, convoy uh, is on its way to Europe to bring munitions and all kinds of help and the four chaplains to the European theater to fight in World War II. And what happened was that the Dorchester, USAT Dorchester, which is the ship that we're talking about, this is the one that sunk on February 3rd, started to develop some steering problems and put into uh, Greenland, actually, for repairs. So it broke away from the uh, convoy. I didn't know that. Mm -mm. Yeah, broke away from the convoy for the repairs, and a day later it was back on the seas again. But this time it was coming through an ice storm in the North Atlantic. And the ice storm was a very, it was was crippling because the, when the storm was over the following day, 902 men were out there chopping ice off the rails and off the decks and off the lifeboats and you name it. Well, anyway, uh, the Dorchester was being tailed by a Nazi submarine, uh, U-221. And uh, at 12.55 a.m., a torpedo struck the midship. Immediately, 150 men were killed. And remember, there's 902 aboard. This was actually a luxury liner converted in 1916, and now and it, no, was it was only built in 1916. Built in 19, converted, yeah, converted for, the war. for the war, but it was built in 1916. It only held 300 passengers total. Mm-hmm. So, okay, here we go. The ship is starting to sink. Four chaplains aboard, who incidentally were also excellent friends. Um, two and two had gone to two separate 
uh, chaplain schools in the United States and uh, uh, got promoted to the ranks of lieutenant. Um, and why were four of them on there together? Uh, because of Hap Arnold, who was the uh, commander of the chaplains at the time, and they needed chaplains in Europe. Okay. I mean, Europe was okay. building up. They didn't have as many as they You know, the, the, the irony is that uh, a chaplain, even though he does not carry a gun, mm -hmm. is an important weapon during the war because what he does is he calms the soldiers. Mm -hmm. right. he, could mm -hmm. he could perform rituals, last rites. He can perform weddings. He can do everything and anything that a secular leader can do, let's say a priest or a rabbi or a minister. He can do any one of these feats that they are supposed to do, and this is what they are trained for. So anyway, as this ship is going down, the chaplains scurry to the uh, bow of the ship and start to guide the men because everything is going crazy. Yes. It's pitch black, mm -hmm. pitch black. Uh, freezing cold. It is freezing mm -hmm. cold, yeah, and the seas are rough. And they're trying to say, go to your stations, go to your stations, because each man, when as, as soon as they board the Dorchester, there is a station there to go to in case of an emergency, such as this one. Mm -hmm. But the men are panicking. A lot of them couldn't even swim. Many of the men who were coming up from the hold or coming up from the inside of the ship, uh, where it was pretty hot, some of from the engine room, uh, didn't have life vests. And the chaplains uh, at the bow of the ship were cracking open uh, cabinets that were actually sealed by ice. Uh, I mean, it was it was just a terrible situation. And when they ran out of the uh, uh, life vests, they took their own life vests off and gave them to the next four soldiers. And this was an act of love and an act of giving that had not been seen by four men together who were men of the cloth. And they knew when they did this that they were giving up their own lives. Mm -hmm. And they did it. You know, it's unbelievable. And, but I'm thinking about, one of the thoughts I had about this, I, 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 I don't know if, and you know, we all plan, we, we know what we're going to do in case of a, an emergency or whatever. Yeah, you think, yeah. We think we know mm -hmm. what we're going to do. And when these emergencies arise, something sometimes takes over. The adrenaline, or you can say mm -hmm. that we become insane for a few minutes or second. February 3, <clears throat> 1943, a ship, the Dorchester, is hit by a torpedo, literally almost splitting immediately the, 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 the ship in half. 900-plus soldiers and crew are on the ship, there was a cruise liner that would have held 314 passengers and 90 uh, crew, uh, crew. So you're talking about three times as many people. Because the, uh, the, the time of the year, of course, it's frigid cold out there, mm -hmm. stormy weather, and uh, because of the alert that uh, there are uh, uh, submarines prowling the, the seas, the captains got orders for the soldiers to remain uh, dressed and as high up as they can instead of below deck as much as they could. What, I, I can't fathom, pardon the expression, what would it be like? You're on the ship no matter where you're at, and you're hit by a torpedo. I guess it's the same as going back to the Titanic when it hit the ice thing. And what goes through your mind? You know, a car, a car when I'm in a car accident... It happened so fast, it's it's over within a split second. Mm -hmm. yeah. Larry, imagine now, what were they thinking? Now you've got everybody scouring uh, all over the place. I, I really don't even have to imagine it because I'm a first-hand witness to a survivor who was one of my dearest friends. Are we speaking about Ernie? We're speaking about Ernie Heaton, yeah. Did the word be shared. Why did Why? Vero Beach? Well, you know, they're, they're, you can go on with 10 radio programs, and we're not going to have all the time right. in the world to cover everything that we have done. Oh, if we could have had Ernie on this show. Well, uh, he is in a it, way. It, in a way, you do, because what Ernie and I decided, um, this is after the first couple of years of touring and, and speaking publicly, um, I would introduce him and talk about this young kid from Holiday's Cove, West Virginia, 
And he was just 18 at the time, and he enlisted. He had three brothers in the military at the time. So that means that there were three blue stars in his mother's window in front of the house. And then, of course, when Ernie joined, there were four blue stars. Excuse me. I didn't know when this, when I didn't know. So you're bringing something I never heard of. During the war, when you had soldiers away from home. When you had a child in the military, yeah. you were able to display mm-hmm. a blue star in the window. Yeah. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, oh. Knee. and yeah. God forbid the child was lost. Yeah or killed during action, then you were able to display a gold star. And that's why you have the gold star uh, mothers today. And, you know, these uh, these were the the parents of, of children who died in the war. Okay, let's get back to Ernie for, in a minute. Let's go back to that moment just before we took the station break. Yeah, what does it feel like to be you in the water and the fear? The four chaplains know the sh- that they're in the bow, the front half of the boat, the yeah. ship. And they know, they're life preserver or not, not every, there's not enough well, uh, uh, life uh, preservers. You, what you do is you, and this is the first time I actually thought about it, but you bring out something, why would they do what they did? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the question is then, why would chaplains do something differently than soldiers, even though the chaplains are soldiers? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the chaplains were not put um, into a combat area where they were actually shooting weapons or, or you know, mm-hmm. destroying enemies or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I guess maybe in their minds, uh, it ran, it, it, and they were good friends too, they probably did discuss something like this, but what oh. could they do, what could they possibly do to teach people or to let people know that chaplains also cared and they also fought in their own way? And they also did very special things. And I think this was the wake-up call to say, you know, here are four chaplains. They gave their lives. They gave their life vest to four men. Strangers. As this ship is going down and the ship is now trembling, uh, the four chaplains are locked arm in arm against the railing and holding on to the railing as well with the other hand in prayer. Uh, our Father who art in heaven, mm-hmm. and the rabbi uh, doing a prayer in Yiddish, uh, or in Jewish, Hebrew. So they went down together, and you know, it, there was a stamp that commemorates this, and it was issued in 1948, Congress issued it, and it was called The Four Immortal Chaplains and Interfaith in Action. And it truly was about interfaith, because one chaplain was a rabbi, one was a priest, one was Episcopal, and the other one was Dutch Reform. Mm. And yet, Mm. if you look at these chaplains, they were all brothers, and they went down as brothers because their father was the same God. Right. They all Mm -hmm. believed in the same God. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later... After the Marines stormed Iwo Jima and those islands, uh, another amazing thing happened. Mm -hmm. Um, This was after Iwo was taken over. There were 80,000 Marines that stormed the island. Uh, 20,000 were wounded. Uh, Almost 8,000 were killed. Correct. And the chief Marine chaplain called upon the Jewish chaplain, Marine chaplain, Chaplain Gittleson, to do the um, uh, oh, ceremony and the opening of the cemetery, to do this whole ceremony at the uh, on Iwo, mm-hmm. and um, there were press and everybody else from all over the free world, and Gittleson did not want to do it because he said there were only seventeen hundred Jews who were involved in in the storming of Iwo, but it wasn't about religion. And mm. but <laughs> you see that's what the the story the the chief chaplain said it, it's not up to you it's up to me it's my call you go ahead and dedicate that cemetery and he went ahead and he did and he stood there and he looked out over the stars of David and the many many crosses rows upon rows and he said 
Whoever is bigoted makes a mockery of what these men have died for because here lie in a perfect harmony men of all different races, Americans. colors, and yeah, creeds. Really? They lie together. And um, he also came out and said that, you know, this is more, well, he went against the grain of everything else. He, he said, you know, this is really about who we are as Americans. And it was a wake-up call, as was the sacrifice of the four chaplains. And I believe that Gittleson absolutely knew every one of those chaplains, mm -hmm. and he went ahead and dedicated as an interfaith. And don't forget, black people, the military was seg segregated at the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And here you had black men laying next to white men as well. Jews and non-Jews alike, right. correct. Right. The color is all still red blood. Right. And That's then, the of point. course, he opened it up and he said, if these men had lived, they would have done great things. What happened with Interface in Action right there as the Dorchester was sinking? And there were, uh, and by the way, how many survived of the 900 plus people mm -hmm. on, the, on the ship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 227 survived. But, you know, even that was connected. Uh, I once heard somebody speak and he said, everybody is connected. And I didn't realize how true it was until I started thinking and connecting things together, and it, it is absolutely true. Um, during the rescue of the Dorchester, there were two Coast Guard cutters that came to the aid, and they were operating uh, uh, 1255 a.m. on the star flares. These are flares that you would send up on parachutes, and they would illuminate the entire area. Hmm. And the captain of both Coast Guard cutters, one was the Comanche and one was the Escanaba, um, on the Comanche, the captain called for rescue. And, of course, a number of the Coast Guard uh, Coast Guardsmen went ahead and they got into the um, uh, uh, lifeboats and they went out and they started rescuing and pulling out of the 650 bodies and things that were floating and then live uh, uh, soldiers, they started pulling out the, the living. And one of the volunteers was a man by the name of Charles W. David Jr. And he was a chief steward aboard the Comanche. And David was a big man. And as soon as he got into the lifeboat and into the, the area, he dove into the water and started rescuing men. This is freezing water. Mm. This, this is and winter, midwinter. It's, it's not only freezing, but the waves are between 10 and 20 feet as oh, well. Wow. So we're talking, mm. talking really rough seas. And uh, David wouldn't come out of the water. He kept on pulling men. And he saved over 25 people. What wow. was unusual about David? What was unusual about David is that during the time of war, there was segregation in the military, and David was a black man. Interfaith in action, Larry. At that time, he was a Negro, and that's what they called them, and he was uh, uh, not as good a soldier with it. This is what the they, they problems with blacks. You see, during World War II, uh, black men were inferior to white men because they couldn't see well at night. <laughs> Where did this come from? Well, it was before basketball became popular on TV and everything else. Now, you didn't realize that black men probably see a lot better than we do. Oh, so it was I want to use the expression Bubba Mises. If anybody yeah. does not know what that means, mm. I'm not going to tell you. And I will, we'll bring that up another time. That's so, yeah. So, anyway, David, uh, they, they had to haul him back into the boat, gets pneumonia, and seven weeks later, he dies in Greenland. Oh, goodness. And what happened was that the Coast Guard uh, was very grateful to him and his services. Sure. And so they awarded him with a number of medals with the, f the family posthumously. And last year, uh, I had the pleasure of presenting a plaque from the Chapel of Four Chaplains to the U.S. Coast Guard cutter, Charles W. David Jr., oh. um, you know, right here in Key West. Mm -hmm. I remember right. you when you went down there. Right. And I met uh, his granddaughter, uh. who was lovely, and about 30 people 
who were the children of the survivors that he had saved. <gasps> wow. Uh, yes. If that doesn't put wow. upside your neck in the well. Such a wonderful story and, and I think a great inspiration for many of us to see individuals willing to lay down their lives in help of others. I want to thank Larry Oko uh, for allowing me to broadcast uh, this segment and uh, to share that with you from his radio show that's heard here in Vero Beach. And uh, I really thank him so much. And and to me, I heard it, and I, I thought it was worth sharing with you. We'll be going to a break in just a couple of moments, but listen to this one verse of the Navy hymn, and I think it will help capture the spirit of our Memorial Day weekend. This is your weekend show. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. We'll be back right after this. On the air and online at yourweekendshow.com with Bob Bierman. The Florida Bible Institute and Seminary exists to glorify Jesus Christ as Lord by preparing adults to evangelize, disciple, and minister to the world. Since 1973, the Florida Bible Institute and Seminary has fulfilled its mission of preparing men and women for ministry. The Florida Bible Institute and Seminary is accessible to students around the world through an online delivery system. Our mission is to equip faithful men and women for the work of ministry by teaching spiritual truths, imparting biblical knowledge, providing practical ministry opportunities, and ground them in the message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you would like to find out if the Florida Bible Institute and Seminary is the school for you, visit their website at tfbis.com. That's tfbis.com. The Florida Bible Institute and Seminary. What do I want? I just want... Your Weekend Show with Bob Bierman. Welcome back to your weekend show. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. So glad you're with us for this special Memorial Holiday Weekend edition of the program. Of course, Memorial Day celebrated here in the United States. When I think about Memorial Day, I think about people that I knew growing up, people that had served in in wars like World War II, Korea, and I even knew people uh, in my younger years that had actually served in the First World War. My father served in the United States Marine Corps during the Second World War in the Pacific. He never spoke too much about it, but I do know that there were people that he knew that never made it home from that war. So much has changed in our world and in recent years. I saw a story the other day that just angered me. I'm sorry, but it really did anger me. We are becoming a postmodern post-Christian, and I think now a post-common-sense world. We have gone to the theater of the absurd. I'm sorry to say that, but we have. Here on this weekend, when we remember those that have died and given their lives for this country, for the freedoms that we are guaranteed, which includes our freedom of speech and our freedom of religion, 
we have things that are just so appalling and so un-American. We are rapidly losing the freedoms that those gallant men since the time of the Revolutionary War have fought to secure. The story I want to cite is about an Air Force general, a two-star general. He was recently blasted by a civil liberties group because he was speaking in uniform about how God has guided his career. Uh, The individual's name is Major General Craig Olson, and he was speaking at the National Day of Prayer Task Force event back on May 7th of this year. In his speech, he refers to himself as a redeemed believer in Christ who credits God for his accomplishments in life and in the Air Force. Well, here's what happened. The Military Religious Freedom Foundation had called for Olson to be, ready for this, aggressively and very visibly brought to justice for his unforgivable crimes and transgressions. They demanded a court-martial adding that any other service member who helped him should also be investigated and punished to the fullest extent of military law. I served in the Air Force, mostly in the Reserve. And I remember when I took my oath to defend my country and to uphold and to protect the Constitution of the United States. At the time that I was in, you would never have conceived of things like this happening. Major General Craig Olson gave a a 23-minute speech. And like I say, he, he gave God so much credit. So let's listen right now to the terrible things, at least according to this, uh, this very suspect group, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation. This is what got them so upset. Here is Major General Craig Olson. I did not go to college. I did not join the military as a Christian. Uh, I actually went in the military because I thought flying would be great, um, and it sounded like fun. I also went in as a very self-sufficient person. I thought if you work hard, study hard, you'll do fine, and that was working great in high school. Did not work very well at the Air Force Academy. That's where I realized I had a very limited intellectual ability. I still carry in this pocket my transcript from the Air Force Academy as Exhibit A in the court of law that you're not a gifted intellect. You have no real academic skills. It's proof right here. But something happened there at the academy. I went to Bible studies because I was free to do that. I was free to go to Bible study. Uh, If someone invited me there, I learned about Christ. I was convicted. I was drawn to commit my life to Christ in April of 1979. And I realized that uh, certainly that would began the journey of learning to depend on someone, depend on someone besides myself. Let's stop depending on Craig and learn to depend on God. That just started at that point. God has been gracious enough and patient enough to give me countless other opportunities to learn greater dependence on him. You mentioned a couple of them as you're reading uh, experiences. Flying complex aircraft, doing complex nuclear missions, I had no ability to do that. God enabled me to do that. He put me in charge of failing programs worth billions of dollars. I have no ability to do that, no training to do that. God did that. He sent me to Iraq to negotiate foreign military sales deals through an Arabic interpreter. I have no ability to do that. I was not trained to do that. God did all of that. In all those experiences and many more like them, I found myself admitting I couldn't do that and handing it over to God in prayer. But those are the the small things. The bigger thing is my lovely bride, Dana. Please raise your hand one more time. You know, he gave me an awesome, beautiful wife uh, of now 32 years to teach me that I needed her desperately to complete myself. I needed her to so support me in all those things that God was appointing me to in the military. And she has stood by me in every one of those. And in many cases, she's been ignored in those things, but she stood by me. It wasn't enough for her, though. God gave us four young men uh, to raise because that's even more complex than, than trying to love your wife. And that's why you turn to people like the Dobsons. 
and others for help to do that. But you get on your knees to do that. Now, Mickey Weinstein is the CEO of this Military Religious Freedom Foundation, and he wrote back on May the 13th a letter to the chief staff demanding that he be court-martialed for violating an Air Force instruction prohibiting Air Force leaders from endorsing a particular belief. Now, an Air Force general who spoke about God has guided his career should be court-martialed. That's what this group was saying. Thankfully, thankfully, the Air Force has decided not to pursue this case, and, and they, they've decided that there's nothing wrong. After all, he was speaking at a private event. This was not a government-sponsored event. This was not a position where he was using his authority over those that are subject under him. He was speaking at the invitation to a group. We, as I said before, are living in a postmodern, post-Christian, and post-common sense nation. I want to throw this in for just a couple of minutes' thought. Now, like I say, we have all these people that are so upset about what happened. And by the way, a spokesman for the National Day of Prayer Task Force said the event where Olson spoke was hosted by a U.S. representative, um, Robert Adderholt, a Republican from Alabama. All invitations to those actively serving in the United States military are coordinated through that congressman's office. But I'll tell you, I, 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 based on the logic that this group has, and, and I've read some of the comments that when you see the news stories where, where the intolerant left is blasting Major General Olson, and they are calling for his head, or did, his resignation or a court-martial, based on that same logic, based on that same logic, if this is true about our nation— that we're supposed to be a secular nation entirely and, and religious speech is just prohibited from the public square. If that is the case, then why back in 1944, when the president of the United States on the evening of the D-Day invasion as they stormed into Normandy to take back Europe from the Nazis. If that be the case, what should have been done when President Roosevelt got on the radio nationwide as the commander and chief of all military in the United States, as commander and chief, the chief executive of the United States of America? If the concept that this group espouses is correct, what should have been done to President Roosevelt when he did this? Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, last night when I spoke with you about the fall of Rome, I knew at that moment that troops of the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another and greater operation. It has come to pass with success thus far. And so, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. For the enemy is strong, he may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. 
They will be sore tried by night and by day without rest until the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. For these men are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters, and brothers of brave men overseas, whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many people have urged that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer. But because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuance of prayer as we rise to each new day and again when each day is spent let words of prayer be on our lips invoking thy help to our efforts give us strength to strengthen our daily tasks to redouble the contributions we make in the physical and the material support of our armed forces. And let our hearts be stout to wait out the long travel, to bear sorrows that may come, to impart our courage unto our sons, wheresoever they may be. And, O oh Lord, give us faith Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other, faith in our united crusade. Let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dulled. Let not the impacts of temporary events, of temporal matters of but fleeting moment, let not these deter us in our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country and with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, almighty God. I guess based on what Weinstein's group is claiming, Roosevelt probably should have been impeached. But that's ridiculous. The same can be said about George Washington, President Washington, when he was General Washington. Before the, the battle at Mount Vernon, 
led his troops in prayer. Washington was never afraid to express his faith, both as a general and as a president. We seem to have revisionist history among us. We are inventing things and making things up that are simply not true. On this Memorial Day, my friend, think about all those that have served this nation and and those that gave the ultimate price. And think of the mockery that is being made as we watch our freedoms slowly being taken away and totally eroded. It's your weekend show with Bob Bierman. The Florida Bible Institute and Seminary exists to glorify Jesus Christ as Lord by preparing adults to evangelize, disciple, and minister to the world. Since 1973, the Florida Bible Institute and Seminary has fulfilled its mission of preparing men and women for ministry. The Florida Bible Institute and Seminary is accessible to students around the world through an online delivery system. Our mission is to equip faithful men and women for the work of ministry by teaching spiritual truths, imparting biblical knowledge, providing practical ministry opportunities, and ground them in the message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you would like to find out if the Florida Bible Institute and Seminary is the school for you, visit their website at tfbis.com. That's tfbis.com, the Florida Bible Institute and the Seminary. It's your weekend show with Bob Bierman. Weekend show. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. I'm so glad you came along for the ride on this Memorial Holiday weekend. I want to remind you, you can contact the show via our website, which is yourweekendshow.com. That's yourweekendshow.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Your Weekend Show. I would sincerely appreciate it if you take some time to visit the website or the Facebook page and let us know that you listen. Well, this is Memorial Day weekend, and I was trying to think of a great way to maybe bring it home to understand the impact of those that gave their life for this country. Back in 1984, on the 40th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, President Reagan gave the following speech. Listen carefully. It is quite inspirational and quite a change from what we hear today. Mr. President, distinguished guests, we stand today at a place of battle, one that 40 years ago saw and felt the worst of war. Men bled and died here for a few feet of, or inches, of sand as bullets and shell fire cut through their ranks. About them, General Omar Bradley later said, Every man who set foot on Omaha Beach that day was a hero. No speech can adequately portray their suffering, their sacrifice, their heroism. President Lincoln once reminded us that through their deeds, the dead of battle have spoken more eloquently for themselves than any of the living ever could. That we can only honor them by rededicating ourselves to the cause for which they gave a last full measure of devotion. Today, we do rededicate ourselves to that cause. And at this place of honor, we're humbled with the realization of how much so many gave to the cause of freedom and to their fellow man. Some who survived the battle of June 6, 1944 are here today. Others who hoped to return never did. Someday, Liz, I'll go back, said Private First Class Peter Robert Zanetta of the 37th Engineer Combat Battalion and first assault wave to hit Omaha Beach. I'll go back and I'll see it all again. I'll see the beach, the barricades, and the graves. Those words of Private Zanetta come to us from his daughter, Lisa Zanetta Hen, 
in a heart-rending story about the event her father spoke of so often. In his words, the Normandy invasion would change his life forever, she said. She tells some of his stories of World War II, but says of her father, the story to end all stories was D-Day. He made me feel the fear of being on that boat waiting to land. I can smell the ocean and feel the seasickness. I can see the looks on his fellow soldiers' faces, the fear, the anguish, the uncertainty of what lay ahead. And when they landed, I can feel the strength and courage of the men who took those first steps through the tide to what must have surely like, looked like instant death. Private Zanatta's daughter wrote to me, I don't know how or why I can feel this emptiness, this fear, or this determination, but I do. Maybe it's the bond I had with my father. All I know is that it brings tears to my eyes to think about my father as a 20-year-old boy having to face that beach. The anniversary of D-Day was always special for her family. And like all the families of those who went to war, she describes how she came to realize her own father's survival was a miracle. So many men died. I know that my father watched many of his friends be killed. I know that he must have died inside a little each time. But his explanation to me was, you did what you had to do, and you kept on going. When men like Private Zanata and all our Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy 40 years ago, they came not as conquerors, but as liberators. When these troops swept across the French countryside and into the forests of Belgium and Luxembourg, they came not to take, but to return what had been wrongly seized. When our forces marched into Germany, they came not to prey on a brave and defeated people, but to nurture the seeds of democracy among those who yearned to be free again. We salute them today. But Mr. President, we also salute those who, like yourself, we're already engaging the enemy inside your beloved country, the French resistance. Your valiant struggle for France did so much to cripple the enemy and spur the advance of the armies of liberation. The French forces of the interior will forever personify courage and national spirit. They will be a timeless inspiration to all who are free and to all who would be free. Today, in their memory, and for all who fought here, we celebrate the triumph of democracy. We reaffirm the unity of democratic peoples who fought a war and then joined with the vanquished in a firm resolve to keep the peace. From a terrible war, we learned that unity made us invincible. Now, in peace, that same unity makes us secure. We sought to bring all freedom-loving nations together in a community dedicated to the defense and preservation of our sacred values. Our alliance, forged in the crucible of war, tempered and shaped by the realities of the post-war world, has succeeded. In Europe, the threat has been contained. The peace has been kept. Today, the living here assembled, officials, veterans, citizens, are a tribute to what was achieved here 40 years ago. This land is secure. We are free. These things are worth fighting and dying for. Lisa Zanata Hen began her story by quoting her father who promised that he would return to Normandy. She ended with a promise to her father who died eight years ago of cancer. I'm going there, Dad. And I'll see the beaches and the barricades and the monuments. I'll see the graves, and I'll put flowers there just like you wanted to do. I'll feel all the things you made me feel through your stories and your eyes. I'll never forget what you went through, Dad, nor will I let anyone else forget. And Dad, I'll always be proud. Through the words of his loving daughter, who is here with us today, a D-Day veteran has shown us the meaning of this day far better than any president can. 
It is enough for us to say about Private Zanetta and all the men of honor and courage who fought beside him four decades ago, we will always remember. We will always be proud. We will always be prepared so we may be always free. An excellent speech worthy of hearing time and time again to remind us of what it cost for our freedom. On this Memorial Day, as we come to the end of this program, I want to thank you for listening, and and please share the program with your family and friends. You can find us at yourweekendshow.com or on Facebook at Your Weekend Show. As we come to the close of this program, let me share this prayer. Almighty God, we commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them. And grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Until next week, this is Bob Bierman saying, God bless and have a great week. the air and online at yourweekendshow.com.